There are two things that we've come to expect in my family when we get together with my siblings and their kids and my parents. The first thing we've come to expect is that someone is not going to be there. Grandkids are grown. They've got, they've got jobs. They've got other families. They've got even sickness at times. And so that's kind of been something that we receive not with um, joy, but we receive with kind of a, oh, someone's not here. The other thing that we've come to expect is when we pray before the meal, because one of the grandkids is not there, my dad's going to be emotional. He's going to be over there crying. We've just come to expect that. I don't know about you, but I love the fact that as men get older, that toughness kind of wears down a little bit. I love it that a tender heart comes out when men get older. That's needed. It's needed to be seen. Men, don't be afraid to cry. Okay? There is such a tenderness and something that just, just really shows that big heart when you get emotional. And that's two things we can expect. Someone's not going to be there, and there's my dad again. It's so endearing to see my dad over there crying. Now, prayer needs to be more than just a moment that we just go, oh, look at cute grandpa crying. It needs to be more than that, right? Especially, especially this time of year, we cannot get lost in all the busyness All of the running around, making sure we got the perfect gift, making sure the meals are done, making sure you don't eat too much, all these things. We get so distracted with everything. We cannot miss the importance of prayer. And in a time of year that the world is focusing on anything and everything but God, we need to pray. We need to be praying. And not just before a meal. We need to be in prayer. Before you even open up a gift, you need to be in prayer. Before your family comes together, you need to be in prayer. You need to be praying that not only your heart is in the right place to honor God, but that your family's heart is softened to God. You need to be praying that those who are grieving because they, they experience this holiday lonely because they've lost a loved one, pray that they will have their heart turned and soften to God. When a world is so caught up in materialism, we need to pray that they understand the greatest gift is Jesus. This is a time that God's people, just like we should every day, but especially now, we need to see in this time of year, we need to see the church on their knees, because I believe there is power when God's people pray. God moves within the prayers of His people. And when we pray, God changes us. Anybody got an amen to any of that? Yes. Yes. So we need to be praying. So what was on my heart is this year we're going to focus the next several weeks on prayer. We're going to focus on prayer because we believe in the power of prayer. So how can we grow in prayer? How can we emphasize prayer? How can we be changed by prayer? We're going to do so by looking at several prayers connected to the coming of Christ, the promise of His coming, and the days surrounding His birth. And so it might be easy to think, oh, where are we going to start? Maybe we'll start in Bethlehem. Maybe we'll start here. Well, we are going centuries before that. I think it's fitting since we just got done talking about Psalms. Does anyone remember who wrote half of the Psalms from the Old Testament? David. King David wrote almost half of the Psalms. And so it would be fitting that we look at this first prayer as we turn our hearts towards prayer and as we celebrate the coming of Christ, we do so by looking at a prayer by David. Again, centuries before Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, we are going to find our first example of prayer. And what is so amazing is how David fits in the narrative of Christ's birth. How David fits in the narrative of Christ's birth even though he lived hundreds of years before Christ's birth. Well, let's see how David fits in to the narrative of Christ's birth. We're going to do so by looking at one of the passages of Scripture that captures this glorious moment where Jesus was born. Luke 2, 1-7. through 7. 
How does David fit? That's going to be what we're answering by looking at this. Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, first of all, we have to understand this is not by happen chance. This is not by, oh, I'm just going to do... God was orchestrating this. The first one to take place. And it took place for a reason. Because the descendants of David needed to go to the home of David in Bethlehem. And that is where Jesus was born. So we see God orchestrating this. Going on. And everyone went to his own town to register. That is the home of their descendants. So Joseph also went up from Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He was a descendant of King David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the story of Jesus' birth. We know that. We know that Mary was a virgin and it was a miraculous conception. We know that Joseph could have stopped the engagement, but an angel came to him in a dream and told him to take Mary as his wife. So because of that, we see that pregnant Mary and her betrothed Joseph, who actually are both descendants of David, go to their family home, hometown, so that they can register for this census, and that is where Jesus is born. Now that was a prophecy that was given centuries earlier that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But not only that, That was a promise given to David centuries before that from his line would come the King Eternal. And we're like, whoa, this is awesome! That God's plan always was Jesus. And God's plan was perfectly orchestrated at just the right time. But we're going to look at a man who was promised. He was promised that his line that his house would stay on the throne, but would contain the king who would live forever. That is the foundation where we find this prayer. And we've got to go, thank you God, because you are awesome, and you've been unfolding your plan from the beginning. So let's look at this promise given to David. But to do so, we have to understand that we're going back in the Old Testament to 1 Chronicles 17. And David had just built a palace made of cedar, okay? Gorgeous palace, because he's king, right? And he desired so bad, he even had gotten from God the specific details, the design to build a temple for God's presence, where, which rested on the Ark of the Covenant. And so David went so bad to build that temple because here he is in this awesome palace and God's presence is in a tent in the tabernacle. So this is where we see the beginning of where this prayer is going to be revealed. Verse 1 of 1 Chronicles 17. After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar while the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is under a tent. David's heart was good. He wanted God to be glorified. He didn't want to to be in a place that was greater than where God's presence was. He wanted to build God a temple in which God had given him the design. That was good. His desire and intent was good. But God had a different plan. Actually, God's plan was for his son Solomon to build the temple. And so we see that God answers that desire. David wants to build a temple. God says no. But we see a greater promise coming. So this is what 
God speaks to David through Nathan, the prophet, in verses 11 through 14. When your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. He's talking about Saul. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Now, some people can read this and and be confused. Well, who's he talking about? Because obviously, he's talking about Solomon, but Solomon doesn't live forever. Who's he talking about? He's actually, God is is speaking a promise that involves two of David's descendants who will be on his throne. The first descendant that he's referring to is the son of David and Bathsheba, Solomon. And he's saying, Solomon, he will succeed the throne. And he will actually be the one that builds the temple. And then he talks about another one. Because then he refers to the one that would sit on the throne forever. The one that would be the fulfillment of David's kingship. And it's not Solomon. It's the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The one who is promised from David, from your line, will be a king who will maintain your throne forever. And it is none other than then the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that was born on that silent night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. There is a promise given here. And imagine David, who does not forget the fact that he was a shepherd, and not just a shepherd, he was the least of his family. He was the smallest, weakest, easily forgotten one. And God came and promised him that he would be on the throne. But now he is getting a promise that his line His house, His throne would carry forever. And we know that that promise is ultimately Jesus. So, unbelievable, right? How this all connects. We even see part of this promise that God had given to David, we see this captured in the New Testament in Hebrews 1, 3 through 5, talking about Jesus, talking about the superiority of Jesus over the angels, but he uses that very promise that was given to David. So we know it's connected to Jesus because it's used in reference to Jesus. Here is Hebrews 1, 3 through 5. The Son, Jesus, is a radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, Jesus, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. So He became as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are My Son, today I have become your Father? Or again, I will be His Father and He will be My Son. So through the Holy Spirit, he's quoting what was promised to David, which was the promise of Jesus, who is being revealed greater than the angels. So all of this points to this promise given to David, that there would be one that would be on his throne, the throne over Israel, forever. And it is none other than Jesus. So how does David respond? David responds in prayer. David responds with a prayer that we're going to focus on and we're going to look at briefly of how we can apply the the heart, the attitude, and approach of David. But David goes to the tabernacle and he prays this prayer. And that's what we're going to look at. It's kind of long, so stay with me. 1 Chronicles 17, 16 through 27. Here is David's response to the promise that is greater than even building the temple, that his line, his house, would be on the throne of God's people forever. 
Here is David's response, verses 16 through 27. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. You have looked on me as though I were the most exalted of men, O Lord God. What more can David say to you for honoring your servant? For you know your servant, O Lord. For the sake of your servant, according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. There is no one like you, O Lord. And there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whose God went out to redeem a people for himself and to make a name for yourself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You made your people Israel your very own forever and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord, let the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house be established forever. Do as you promised so that it will be established and that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, the Lord Almighty, the God over Israel, is Israel's God. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. You, my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him. So your servant has found courage to pray to you. O Lord, you are God. You have promised these good things to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, O Lord, have blessed it and it will be blessed forever. That's David's prayer. What can we learn from that? What can we learn from that? How can that position us to not only be faithful in prayer, but also be changed by prayer. The first thing that we see from David that we can apply in our communication with God is this. We should always pray from humility. We should always pray from humility. Always pray from humility. David's prayer starts with the following in verses 16 through 17. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And now, O God, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your servant a lasting dynasty. You speak as though I were someone very great, O Lord God. See, David does not forget the fact that he committed adultery and then had someone murdered. He does not forget the fact that God's grace, God's grace forgave him. He does not forget the fact that he was the least in his family. He does not forget the fact that he ran for his life for years. He is very humbled in coming to God and he says, I'm nothing special. It is you, God. It is you who have chosen me who does not deserve what you've given me. Who am I? David recognizes God's favor and grace that is undeserving. And that position of humility is so important in prayer. We don't come to God like a buddy and say, what's up God? I've got a few things to chat with you about. We don't do that, do we? We don't come to God as, as if He is an equal. We come to a holy, awesome God who spoke the heavens and earth into creation. We come to a holy God that died for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we come to Him with Him elevated because we are humbled. We don't come to Him like a genie in the bottle and say, hey, can you do this, this, and this? We don't come to Him in any other way but to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is Your name, David. David is able to be positioned as a servant of God because he is humble before his God. David is able to be positioned for praising God because he is humbled by his God. He is able to trust his God because he is humbled before his God. And for us, what an important lesson for us. We approach prayer by being humbled because we need Him. We approach prayer in humility 
because we know we don't deserve all He's given us. And we are humbled. And that place of prayer will not only elevate God as our protector and our provider and our, the one who forgives and delivers us, but it positions us to be changed by prayer. To be changed by prayer. God spoke through Peter that He opposes the proud. If you're prideful in your prayer, and you're just like, okay, God, I'm just going to do this, or hey, I, can you do this, or I need this, that is pride. And God opposes the proud. But does anyone know what He gives to the humble? Men should know this. We did this in our study. What does He give to the humble? Grace. Grace. God gives us what we don't deserve. And He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And so, we see that humility from David. When Jesus taught His disciples how to pray, it was all from a position of humility before a holy, awesome God who has adopted us as His children and He is our Abba Father as the Spirit cries out. This is what Jesus taught. And look at the position of humility when Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father in Heaven, not our Father who is conveniently in my pocket when I need Him. No, our Father in Heaven, hallowed, holy be Your name. Your kingdom, not my kingdom, your kingdom come. Your will, not my will. This is all humility talking. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has authority in both earth and heaven. Give us today our daily bread. In humility, He's saying, pray recognizing God alone is your provider. Forgive us our debts. Humility recognizes God as the forgiver. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive others. We need to be obedient and that takes humility. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Humility allows God to be the healer, the protector, the provider, the deliverer, the one who forgives. May we come, first of all, in a place of humility where we can cry out, our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We will be changed by prayer when we start with humility. The second thing we see from David's example, we should always pray from promise. We should always pray from promise. And what that means is, is we pray in full assurance and confidence that God will do what he promised to do. Full assurance. We pray from promise. Full assurance and confidence that God will do what He promised to do. Here again is what David prayed in verse 19. O Lord, for the sake of Your servant and according to Your will, You have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. And David, David trusted God because he knew God was good on His Word. He had seen it in his life. What God promised he would do. And we must take that position of prayer as well. That we pray in confidence that God will complete that which he began. That God will fulfill that which he promises. That is a position of hope. Not hope in people. Not hope in what we can do. Not hope in what the world can offer us. But hope in our God who is faithful. And the thing that's so important to connect here is David is praying after just hearing that his life desire, his greatest pursuit to build a temple for God was just told no. And we don't see David praying Come on, God, please. I want to do this for you. God, I, my whole life I've wanted to do this. This is so deep in my heart. It's who I am. God, please let me build you. He doesn't do that, does he? Because his prayer that comes from promise is a prayer that trusts 
in God's promises. And it is a prayer that submits to God's will. You see, that is a place of prayer that allows us to not only trust God, but then serve God with everything we are. Look at David's response or how he prays from this place of trusting God even though he was told no, that he couldn't build the temple. This was his response in verse 23. And now, Lord, let the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house be established forever. Do as you promised. Because he was trusting that God's plan was better than his. That God's work was greater than his work. And that God's will was perfect. How many times do we pray and we struggle to surrender? We struggle with that prayer of not my will, but your will. We struggle because we say, God, please change this person. God, please bring this healing. God, please These things are good and God, please do this. But do we then take that place of trust and surrender to say, but not my will, but yours. Not what I want because I trust you. And that is where we see David. That is where God moves in a powerful way that changes us from our prayers. Because then we can say in full assurance, I trust you, I am yours, not me. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? The way that we do that is making sure we understand the only way we can pray to God is through a high priest. The only way that God receives us in relationship is through the one who died for us. The only way our prayers are even heard is because of Jesus. And so when we pray, we pray in surrender, we pray in submission, we pray yes because of Jesus. And so when God doesn't answer the prayer we want, we in confidence can say, I trust you because of Jesus. When we go through a season and we pray for years and years and years and something doesn't happen, we can say yes I trust you because of Jesus. Because the one that overcame sin is the one between us and God who hears our prayers and moves within our prayers. The one who overcame death and the one who's coming back is the one who is between us and God. And when we pray, God receives our prayers, but we submit in our prayers because Jesus is king and we are not. That's why we can say yes to Jesus. Yes Do you know that even saying amen, amen literally means yes. Yes. Yes to you. Yes to your will. And when we pray, whose name do we pray in? In Daryl's name? No. Whose name do we pray in? Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In other words, that heart and position says, Through Jesus alone, I say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your plan. Yes to your work. Yes to your purpose. In Jesus alone. This is what the Apostle Paul revealed. Apostle Paul revealed that our yes is Jesus. Our amen is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 1.20. 2 Corinthians 1.20. And this is all connected to how Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise of God. This is what Paul writes. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. The promises given in the garden, Jesus fulfilled it. Resounding yes. The promise to Moses. The promise to to Joseph. The promise to Abraham. The promise to David. It is yes because Jesus fulfilled it. And when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name because our response is yes to Jesus. Jesus only. Not me, but my king. And I submit my prayer. I give a petition. I can ask God for healing, but I submit and say, your will, not mine. And the result is this. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory through our high priest, our mediator, 
the one we submit to, and the one we trust because we say yes to Christ alone. Okay, last one. Moving right along, moving right along. We should always pray from courage. We should always pray from courage. Here again is what David prayed. Always pray from courage. You, my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build a house for him. So your servant has found courage to pray to you. O Lord, your God, O Lord, you are God. You have promised me these good things to your servant. You've promised these good things to your servant. David found courage. David found a place of trust and surrender because he approached God in humility and in hope in what God had promised. And I wonder how many of us here today, God is wanting to increase courage in our prayers. Increase courage. Maybe it's the courage to even come to God in prayer. I love the story of, that, I, that I heard where a man was rejecting God his whole life and a Christian encouraged him, just pray to God. Just pray to Him and watch Him move. Pray to Him and watch Him change your circumstance. And this man who didn't even believe in God, his situation was so bad that he called out to this God, this God of his friend, and God answered the prayer and moved in a miraculous way. There was courage. He approached God and God moved. For some of us, when we have been disappointed, when we have not had our expectations met, it takes courage to come and say, God, I'm yours. I trust you. Well, God wants to give us courage. Maybe it's even that faith to pray for that healing with a surrender of no matter how God determines to heal. God wants us to pray in courage. David had courage to go before God. We need to have courage. And the reason why we have courage is because the one who stands between us, our mediator, Jesus Christ, the one who says, as he gave us this invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. See, we have been given an invitation that we can come to Jesus at any time and he will receive us by grace and he receives us and then we can offer up our prayer as one who has been received by our Savior. We can offer up a prayer of courage because we, we are completely covered by the one who has fulfilled all of God's promises. And so we can say yes. Yes to Jesus. Yes and amen. Because Jesus Christ is Savior, Lord, and King. I'd like to close for us just by praying for each of us. If that God wants to increase a humility in your prayer, that God would do that. If God wants to increase a hope and surrender to the promises, that God would do that increase in you. Or if that God would want to increase a courage where you are entering into the fullness of of Jesus Christ, and you can say yes to Jesus in prayer. I want to pray that. So if you would, join with me in prayer. Father God, we come to you. And first of all, thank you that we have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Thank you for that promise that was given even centuries before Jesus was born. That promise that the King, the King would be on the throne over God's people forever. And thank you that that promise, that promise was Jesus. But God, I thank you that we have now been grafted into that promise because for those who receive Jesus, believe in him, give our life to him, we are your children and we can come to you and we can communicate with you as our holy, awesome God, but also our perfect, loving Father. And we can pray to you because your spirit even cries out, Abba, Father, Daddy. So God, I ask that we can have that humility, that humility that knows that we don't deserve the relationship with you, but your love has offered what we don't deserve. Your grace has done what we couldn't do. So God, give us that humility that completely approaches your throne through grace. So give us that place where you are exalted and that we come as your children. 
also, God, I pray that for each of us, that Christ may increase in our life. That Christ may increase more of Jesus in our choices, more of Jesus in our family, more of Jesus over our weakness, more of Jesus over our sin, more of Jesus over our attitudes, more of Jesus over our thoughts, more of Jesus. And so that when we come to you in prayer, it is a continual submission to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And our prayers are always yes to Jesus, more of Jesus. And may that result in a courage where we live every day Every day, boldly coming to you through your Son. Boldly coming to you on behalf of others. Boldly coming to you in in disappointment. Boldly coming to you in discouragement. Boldly coming to you in our weakness. Because we come through Jesus Christ, our way maker. And we say yes to you. And we die to ourselves so Christ may increase. And all of it, God, is so that our life, our prayers, Our heart is changed because of Jesus. God, I pray that work in each one here. And God, if anyone is outside of Jesus, and they are just a listener on the outside, but God, You've been working on their heart, may they no longer wait. May they understand that call is from You. May they understand that grace is from You, and that forgiveness, and healing, and relationship, and that new beginning is all from You. May we all respond, no matter where we are at in our faith, respond to Jesus, and say yes, yes, and amen. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.